My name is Lindsay and I am going to talk to you guys today about oncology and kind of everything that it entails and um, kind of some highlights as to what we do here at MBS as well. Uh, in general, I want this to be super uh, upbeat. A lot of times you hear about cancer and you kind of start thinking all the negative things that go along with that, but um, my job is fantastic. I laugh almost all day long, um, believe it or not, and um, so I hope you guys take some positive things from this and not, um, not negative things about cancer. Also, I want to keep this super informal. If you have any questions at all, please stop me. Um, ask anything you want. If I don't know the answer, I'm going to tell you I don't know the answer, um, but I'll definitely be able to get back to you if I need to. So, The role of the technician, which obviously is you guys, what does that mean? First of all, let's talk about cancer. Um, so you have a client that comes in and you tell them they have cancer. What does that mean? Each year, the leading cause of death in pets is cancer. It's across the board, it's any age. It's 47% canine and around 32% feline. And that number-wise is about 8 million or more cats and dogs each year. So you're definitely going to see it. It's going to come in. What do you do with it when it comes in? Cancer is a lump, a bump tumor, mass, or growth. Um, it's defined as the process where normal cells undergo a, uh, an excessive or unrestrained growth. They shouldn't be doing whatever they're doing. It can happen to any organ in the body. It can travel from one organ to another organ. And you should know that there's over a hundred types or classifications of cancer. So if you say, hey, your dog has cancer, well, there's many, many details to that. There are several classifications, and we're going to briefly uh, touch on these. Um, first one we're going to start with is a sarcoma. So a sarcoma begins in the tissue that connects, supports, or surrounds other organs. This is typically going to be your muscle, your bone, or your fibrous tissue. As you can see in this little picture here, these cells are what we call spindle cells. So they do have a large nucleus in the middle, then they have a taper and a little tail that goes with them. So if you're doing a cytology on any kind of mass or tumor and you hit on some of these guys, you can start thinking in your head, well, this could be a sarcoma. The most typical sarcomas that we see are going to be hemangiosarcomas, which are very bloody. Um, that's typically a bleeding splenic tumor. Uh, it can be at the base of a heart, and hemangiosarcoma is also in the skin, more rarely, but it is found there. There's fibrosarcomas, osteosarcoma, which is going to be bone. It can be bone of any sort. Um, I've seen them in vertebrae, I've seen them in legs, the jaw bone, so again, it can be any bone and soft tissue sarcoma. Soft tissue sarcomas are going to be masses that you can see on the outside of the body that are not lipomas. Everybody knows what a lipoma is. Everybody's seen the fat lab that comes in that looks like bubble wrap because he's got so many <laughs> lipomas on him. Um, this is going to be a much more dense feeling sarcoma um, or, or mass that's on the outside of the body um, because like I said it is in the dermis or the muscle layer um, but it's going to feel different than that fatty lipoma. The next classification we have is a carcinoma. So carcinomas uh, are going to be a cancer that originates in the tissues that cover the body surface. Uh, this can also be something that lines the body cavity or it comprises an organ. These cells on cytology, as you can see here, are all crammed together. They are going to be in clusters, if you will. They're all going to look the same. So these uh, carcinoma cells here are, uh, again, um, one main nucleus, um, but just huge, huge groups of them, kind of front to back on your slide. Um, and again, they're all going to be very similar in character, so they're not going to look a whole lot different from their neighbor. Some types of these are going to be mammary adenocarcinoma. So these are um, a lot of times found in either late spayed dogs. We also find them in cats. We had a cat uh, either this week or last week that had a mammary mass. Um, and the surgical approach to this mammary mass was a radical mastectomy. So an entire mammary chain from basically its sternum to its inguinal, uh, inguinal right leg um, was removed. And it was about as long as from here to my arm to my fingertips. Radical surgery done on that. So again, that's mammary adenocarcinoma. Um, transitional cell carcinoma. This is going to be in the bladder, so it's the lining of the bladder. A lot of times we'll see those uh, in the trigone area of the bladder. Prostatic carcinoma. Obviously, male dog there, you're going to find it in the prostate. Squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cells are going to love the mouth and the nose. And so these are a lot of times our cats that are coming in with oral lesions, oral masses. Um, they can get pretty necrotic, pretty smelly. Um, so your squamous tissue there. Renal carcinoma, that's going to be your kidney masses. Um, and then anal sac, apocrine gland, adenocarcinoma. It's a big word. Basically, it's cancer of the anal gland. That's all that means. 
Um, the third and kind of fourth um, delineation of cancer um, is going to be a round cell tumor. So this is a cancer that comes from the round cells of the body. Typically on your cytology it's going to be individual cells, which you can see the arrows here. They're somewhat clustered together, but in general they're kind of scattered along your slide. Um, most characteristic of what you're going to find with this is going to be your lymphoma. This is going to be um, either B cell lymphoma or T cell lymphoma and we're going to uh, dive into that a little bit later on in the presentation here. Um, these types of cancers are, uh, or lymphoma rather, is going to be a low grade, intermediate grade or high grade pathologist is going to be the one that's going to tell you that. You're not going to see that from your cytology in house. Uh, also mast cell tumors, everybody's seen the boxer or pit bull that comes in with a pink fleshy mass. That's typically what a mast cell tumor looks like. Those are also graded, typically one through three. Um, with that grade system, again, that's not something that you're going to get from cytology. It is something that you have to remove uh, and send in for a biopsy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, a TVT, we don't see a lot of TVTs. Um, TVTs are transmissible venereal tumors. Um, these are coming from intact female, intact male dogs. Um, so again, we don't see a lot of those around here because most of our pets are spayed and neutered, um, but you can see these occasionally. Um, and then a histiocytoma is gonna look very similar. Thankfully, a histiocytoma is benign, um, so you don't have to get as concerned with that one. The last class will be melanoma. Like I say, it's a class all of its own. Um, Melanomas are going to be pigmented. Uh, we have some of these uh, guys and girls that we will do a, attempt a cytology on and it almost looks like ink coming out on your slide. Melanomas have the melanin in it which is black and so if you do any kind of cytology and you see this black material, like I said, you can start thinking about melanoma as that one. We're going to touch on specialist care a little bit. So obviously you guys come in here, we have our uh, oncology specialty. What that means is the veterinary oncologist um, has gone through some specialized training um, to be an oncologist, to, to train in oncology. There are three types um, of oncology, so we'll touch on each one of those. We have uh, medical oncology, which is what I assist in. Um, that's going to be the general study or treatment of cancer. They are certified by the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, so internist. And typically what they're doing is diagnostic workup and chemotherapy of some sort. So my day, like I said, is typically comprised of a lot of chemotherapy um, and diagnostics. There is surgical oncology. Um, these surgeons are specifically concerned with what type of surgery they're doing to help with cancer. We have boarded um, surgeons that are here um, that do a fabulous job, but there are actual surgical oncologists out there as well. So these um, surgical oncologists are usually teaming up with medical oncologists to formulate the perfect plan to both remove a tumor or mass or lump or bump, and then we're coming in behind them with chemotherapy to help uh, even more. Uh, and like I said, they have specialty training and expertise in abdominal, skin, bone, and soft tissue procedures. There is radiation oncology. Um, unfortunately, here in Nashville, we don't have radiation oncology right now. Um, all of the ones that we see here we're actually sending to Blue Pearl in Atlanta. There's also radiation oncology in UT. Um, we just have a very good relationship with the radiation oncologist in Atlanta. Um, so he is um, a specialty concerned with prescribing radiation therapy in all forms. So he is again somebody that's going to be combined with medical and surgical oncology. Sometimes we do all three. Um, we can utilize all three together, typically with uh, radiation being the third in line for um, that order is if the patient's getting all three. Um, and they are actually certified uh, by the American College of Veterinary Radiology. So they are radiologists uh, as well as oncologists. Some cancers, um, it kind of depends on where it's at. Obviously, um, things like abdominal things, like a splenic tumor, radiation oncology is not going to be where you jump to. But if you have, a, if you have an osteosarcoma of the jaw, and you can't surgically remove all of that, you can come in with radiation and they can zap that and help to, uh, help to get that going. Um, so you guys are gonna be very heavily involved in your owner education because they see you guys before they see the doctor a lot of times, or you're doing callbacks for the doctor, let's say, um, and you need to unfortunately deliver the bad news that your, their pet has cancer. So um, they're gonna have a lot of questions for you and hopefully this will help you guys to answer some of their questions and to help ease some of their um, ease some of their fears that they have. Why did their pet get cancer? What caused it? Well, first of all, they need to know it is not their fault. There's nothing they could have done or nothing that they did that caused their pet to have cancer. There are several environmental and genetic factors that come into play. 
any breed, any age can get cancer. My youngest patient is eight months old. My oldest patient is 21 years old. So any age, any breed can get, can get cancer. Um, and despite some of the factors um, with developing cancer or exposure to those factors, they, a dog and cat can still get cancer. It's just their luck, if you will, albeit bad luck. Um, with owner education, we're going to go through a few of these um, because I think that there are some things that you can do to help your client prevent their pet from getting cancer. Everybody's seen this cat on the left. It waddles in. It cannot stand on all fours for very long at all. Um, that's a problem. Their body is already fighting inflammation. Obesity is not a cause of cancer, but obesity can definitely um, expose their body to being more readily apt to get cancer. So um, one of the many reasons that you should always talk about proper diet, proper body score of pets um, is cancer. Spaying and neutering. It's pretty widely known that female dogs, if they go through their first heat cycle, that's going to increase their rates or their chance to get malignant mammary cancer as an adult. Definitely, definitely push for your spaying and neutering before that first heat cycle. Um, with neutering male dogs, obviously if you take the testicles away, you take the chance for testicular cancer away, which is a great thing. Unfortunately, you're not taking the prostate away. And we do see quite a few dogs that have prostatic cancer, um, so unfortunately you can't eliminate that. Um, but you can, of course, completely rule out testicular cancer by, by neutering. Genetics. So. There are um, a few breeds, both cat and dog, um, that have a higher chance of cancer. Um, Flat-coated retrievers, for instance, have malignant histiocytosis. Scotty dogs and Westie dogs very commonly get TCC of the bladder. Um, Siamese cats can get mammary carcinomas and intestinal carcinomas. And um, just from anecdotal experience, I'll add golden retrievers and doodles to this list, which is very sad because they're some of the best dogs ever. Um, but they are my number one breed that I see. I see a lot of goldens. I see a lot of doodles of golden doodle, labradoodle. You mix it with a doodle and it's probably going to come to me. Um, like I said, you see a lot of these. Um, and again, all ages. I see a couple young ones, two or three years old, and I've got some older ones. So um, old golden retriever, something likely is going on with him that he should see us with. Environmental carcin carcinogen, excuse me. This is kind of a big one and something I didn't really realize or, or think about until I came over to oncology. Indoor only animals, they have a much higher exposure to secondhand smoke. Um, you know, there's those, again, those clients that bring their cats in, you open the cat carrier and you're just being hit with a wave of cigarette smoke. Well, when the cat's grooming, it's licking all those those toxins off. It's ingesting all those toxins. Um, and again, that's going to be something that's going to increase that cat's chance of cancer. So as much as you can tell the owner it's not their fault that their pet got, ca got cancer, like I said, there's definitely some things we can tell them to help reduce that risk. So again, once we, have, um, once we know we have cancer, um, we need to start working that up. One of the biggest things to be very upfront with your client about um, is letting them know that there are many steps to not only confirming the cancer, getting a proper diagnosis, but also staging. Um, staging is a term that they use a lot in human medicine, you know, what stage of cancer, breast cancer, lymphoma, whatever it is. Um, we do that with animals too. Unfortunately, if your client comes in and you do a cytology, let's say of a mast cell, and you tell them, okay, you're, this is a mast cell. Well, that's only one piece of the puzzle. What grade is the mast cell? Has the mast cell spread to the chest? Is the mast cell in the lymph node? Like I said, there's many, many different um, pieces to that puzzle. It is nearly impossible to formulate an accurate plan without a definitive, definitive diagnosis. Excuse me. Again, I'll use mast cell as, a, um, as an example. There are some mast cells that we take off, send it to the pathologist, it comes back as a low grade one. Those don't get chemo. Those don't get a second surgery. Those don't really get anything but monitoring. We have some mast cells that we take it off, we send it to the pathologist, and it's a high grade three. Those sometimes will get a second surgery, they'll get chemo, and they'll get radiation. So there's a lot of, le uh, a, lot of, um, uh, of a range, a bigger range, if you will, of what that can be. And so again, if you do a cytology and you see it's a mast cell, well, that's great, but what all does that mean? Um, as technicians, we're going to serve a crucial role in helping this uh, veterinarian or specialist, in my case, um, get samples of whatever it may be um, and handle those. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is a body map, and I have an example of a body map here. Again, gonna, going back to that Labrador that feels like bubble wrap because it's got so many lipomas, are they all lipomas? If we stick a couple of those and they're not a lipoma, well, we want to know where it's at, how big it is on that date. 
Um, is it open? Is it uh, draining anything? That sort of thing. So I would say if you have more than three to five masses on the outside of the body that are concerning to you, pull out a body map so that you can write the size. Obviously, you're going to have the date of it. Um, and then any other notes, you know, is it oblong today? Does it have an extra little mass on top of it? All those characteristics that you need to remember so that six months down the road when you see this pet back and they say I think it's gotten a little bit bigger since last time well you can pull out your calipers and you can measure it and you can tell them yes it's bigger no it's not um, so our diagnostic workup um, there are like I said quite a few pieces that go along with that we're gonna have some basic staging tools used in the diagnosis and planning and we're gonna go through what each of these are kinda uh, briefly and hit on the most important parts of those some of these you guys can do in general practice before you ever send us a patient for um, an oncology workup. Um, some of them are pretty basic, some of them are not. So like I said, we'll touch on these uh, each individually. First of all, the physical exam, it's pretty self-explanatory there. CBC and chemistry, plus or minus your analysis, also a baseline tool. Three view thoracic radiographs. You'll notice I have three big and bold, and we'll, we'll talk about why in just a second. Cytology or histopathology, we'll go through the pros and cons of that. Uh, ultrasound, kind of what we use ultrasound for. Um, computed tomography or CT scan, that's something that we have here at NVS that um, is a very specialized diagnostic tool that um, not everywhere has, obviously. Flow cytometry, this is going to be something specific to lymphoma, um, and so we'll touch on the details of that. That's actually something that you guys can do in your own clinic as long as you're, you know, knowing the steps to do it. Um, and it will help to delineate that B cell versus T cell that we talked about. And then an EKG, I'll throw that in there. That is um, somewhat specific to a drug called doxorubicin that we use. Um, so typically with the EKG as part of this workup, that's something that we're doing here in our hospital before we're administering that drug. So let's talk about the physical exam. Some things to note. First of all, change in a weight history. So when you saw Lucky six months ago, did he weigh 80 pounds and now he's 60? Or did he weigh 61 pounds and now he's 60? That's important. Um, if we've had a dramatic weight loss, then we need to know what's the reason for that weight loss. If you say, hey, have you had him on a reduced calorie diet or have you been feeding less and they tell you no, well then there's a reason why this dog has lost weight and we want to find out why. What is the overall condition of the pet if the tumor was not there? Do you have hip dysplasia? Do you have a, um, a prior injury that you're healing from? Do you have glaucoma in your eyes? There's other parts of the physical exam that can sometimes hinder your response to chemotherapy or surgery if you're going under anesthesia. So like I said, counseling out the tumor, what does the pet look like? Where is it located? This is, again, it's going to be a factor as to is it surgical, is it going to respond to radiation, is it lymphoma, which you don't do surgery or radiation for, you just do chemo for. How big is it? This is an example of a caliper. These are about $2 on Amazon. I would recommend that you get one if you don't have one in your clinic already. This is going to be um, what you're using to measure. So typically we're measuring in centimeters and millimeters when we're talking about a mass that um, we can get to and lymph node measurements. Again, this being very specific to lymphoma, we want to be able to get exact measurements. You know, are they two centimeter uh, lymph nodes? Is this one four centimeters and this one one and a half centimeters? That sort of thing. Um, so like I said, I would definitely, definitely recommend um, a set of calipers if you don't already have them and if you're not already using them. CBC and chemistry. Um, Again, this is going to be a baseline for any medical issue, whether you have kidney disease, diabetes, cancer, what have you. Definitely something that you always want to recommend. This is also good um, for you to look back on, on your routine blood works. So if you've had a pet in, they're eight years old, and every year since their first visit, you've done you know, a small chemistry and CBC, what do the kidney values look like from when they were two or three years old compared to now? So again, a, a CBC chemistry is definitely something that um, is going to be very high up on our diagnostic list. Um, a few things to note whenever you get your uh, results back. Anemia. We um, have a lot of anemic patients. Usually it's very mild anemia, um, but in general most of my patients have some form of anemia. A lot of that is in regards to chemotherapy that they're receiving, but again it is something that's very commonly seen uh, in, our, in our patients. Leukocytosis. This is a very common factor in determining leukemia. I have seen some white blood cell counts as high as 200,000. That's significant. That dog, if 
feels awful. So again, like I said, CBC, um, if you're seeing a leukocytosis that's in the 50,000, 60,000, 70,000 and above, and again, there's no outward cause why, it's not fighting an infection, it doesn't have a wound, uh, that sort of thing, then again, we may be thinking of leukemia. Uh, calcium level. So there are a few cancer processes that will cause an increased calcium level. Um, the top two are going to be lymphoma and your apocrine gland adenocarcinomas, the anal sac disease. Um, so if you have elevated calcium on your blood work and your doctor has not done a rectal exam, you may want to push for them to do that because like I said, very commonly we'll find an anal sac tumor there. Uh, a glucose level. Decrease can indicate an insulinoma. Some of my insulinoma patients are hovering in the 40s. That's significant as well. Um, it also is something to think about whenever you're sending in your blood sample to IDEX or Antec or wherever. If your tube has, um, if your red rubber has your blood in it for, you know, six or eight, nine, ten hours and it hasn't been spun down, you're going to have a low glucose typically. So I would recommend that if you guys can, spin all your blood work down before you send it to the lab because then if you spun it as soon as it clots and you still get back a dog that's lost weight and is eating well but it has some tremors and all of a sudden you have a low glucose, then that's, like I said, something that we may be looking for, which is an insulinoma. Um, and then ALT is one of the liver values. Um, I will mention that the uh, elevated values can affect certain chemotherapy options. We have a drug called Lomustine that affects the ALT. If it's very, very elevated, then that's not a drug we can use. And we're going to want to know if we can use that drug or not in some of our mast cell cases, our lymphoma cases, um, what have you. So like I said, across the board, CBC and chemistry, you're going you're gonna to hit on quite a few things that will be helpful in the, uh, in the oncology patient. Um, your analysis. In general, um, a urinalysis is not something that we um, bank a lot on. Uh, I will say, however, that you definitely want to use a, an ultrasound if you're doing a cysto. I would not recommend a blind cysto, um, especially if you have a Westie or a Scotty or a Cairn Terrier because those breeds are very, very known to have bladder tumors. This is a bladder tumor um, in one of our former patients that was a Westie. So with um, collection of a urine sample by cysto with a dog that has a bladder tumor, you're potentially spreading that cancer through every layer that your needle comes out of. And so it's very important, like I said, uh, would not recommend blind cystos. There are certain chemotherapies that are caustic to the bladder. Um, there's a drug in our lymphoma protocol that can cause sterile hemorrhagic cystitis. And so that's basically just going to be an irritation of the bladder wall. It's not something that um, is an infection, but it is very painful. And so if we already have some bladder issues going on, we don't necessarily want to jump and give that drug. Um, and then carboplatin, which again is another drug that we use, um, can actually be toxic to the uh, renal system if they are already showing any kind of damage. So our cats and dogs that have elevated kidney values or if they're in kidney failure, carboplatin is not a drug that we're going to jump into. Any questions so far? Anybody got anything? What are some other like environmental things? Like Ooh. That's a good question. You know, the ones I have are, are the main ones. Um, we don't, in our area at least, we don't have like factories that are putting a bunch of chemicals into the ground that we're getting a lot of pets from, things like that. Um, again, anecdotally, I'll tell you about a, um, a client that we have. So my mom and all of my family grew up just past the Tennessee, Kentucky line in a little town called Franklin. When my mom was growing up, they were tobacco farmers long, long time ago. Um, and so I know that land, I've been on all that land. Well, we have a client that comes to us who we have seen, I wanna say eight or nine of their pets. Every one of them has nasal cancer. So there are some environmental factors. Um, in my opinion, um, those dogs and cats are just out sniffing the ground like dogs and cats do, but again, they're on old, old tobacco farming land. We all know that tobacco has its um, carcinogens in it. So again, that's just kind of an anecdotal thing, um, but um, like I said, the ones that I listed are definitely going to be the, the main ones. Yes, ma'am? I just went to a CE last week and they were talking about coal burning areas, mm -hmm. kerosene heaters, and households that are poor. Right. Uh, fair haired white cats, dogs that sunbathe outside. Yes, definitely solar induced. Mm -hmm. so yep, yep. 
We yeah, it happens, definitely. A lot, I mean, we don't have a lot of the coal things in our area, obviously, like West Virginia and things like that. So sometimes your environmental factors are going to be where you live. Um, so that's a, you know, that's a very good example of that. I have family in West Virginia that, you know, likely their animals are, are in a different environmental exposure than they are here. Um, and like you said, definitely white cats that like to sunbathe. They can get little things on the tips of their ears, the tips of their nose. We see fewer of those than I think I did, honestly, 10 or 12 years ago in general practice. I'm not sure why. But, um, but yes, it's also a, a good example of that. So radiographs, like I mentioned earlier, do three views. You've already got them on the table. Why not go ahead and get that third view? So with uh, cancer, with oncology, when we're talking about radiographs, what we're talking about is chest rads. This is a basic tool for every single pet that walks into my door. We are going to be doing a three view, so left side down, right side down, and on our back. Um, and that is the standard of uh, care, standard um, for staging. We can see a lot of things on a left lateral that we might not see on a right lateral. Um, and so like I said, if you have any question at all as to does this pet have cancer or we know it has cancer, we need to do some of these diagnostic tools before we send you to an oncologist, we need 3D x-rays. If we don't, we're just going to have to spend their money, unfortunately, and, and do it here. Abdominal x-rays. Abdominal x-rays, I don't need them. We don't use them. Um, it's sometimes um, somewhat of a, a peace of mind issue for a client to do an abdominal x-ray. You know, if you tell the owner on palpation you feel a cranial abdominal mass, well, they're going to ask where is it coming from or what's it attached to. You can do an abdominal x-ray. Um, it's just going to confirm that there is a mass there. If it's in the cranial abdomen, it could be on the spleen, it could be on any liver lobe, and you can't really tell them that from an x-ray. With any kind of abdominal mass, ultrasound is going to be um, gold standard for that because, again, we're looking at every organ in the abdominal cavity from the diaphragm to the tail. We can measure the mass. We can say what lobe of the liver it's on, if it's on a liver lobe, where is it at on the spleen. Um, so, like I said, with abdominal x-rays, honestly, I wouldn't waste the client's money unless they are just pushing for knowing some kind of information as to where the you know, tumor may be. Cytology versus histopath. Um, this is going to be kind of a big one for oncology. Obviously, we want to know what this mass or tumor is. There's pros and cons to both, so we'll touch on those. Um, with cytology, it's inexpensive. Um, a needle and syringe is all it takes, and I usually explain to owners um, when we're getting a cytology here, it's the same size needle as we gave your dog cat vaccines with. You know, if they hear a needle biopsy, sometimes they get very afraid of what size is that needle. I always reassure them it's no different than what they got their vaccines with. No anesthesia is needed for a cytology. Typically, we don't do any kind of local block whatsoever if we're doing a cytology. So again, no anesthetic is needed. Very easy to collect a sample, obviously, um, and it can have a quick turnaround. So everybody, if not most everybody, has a microscope in-house. So you can take some cells, look at it under this microscope slide, or your doctor can. And again, you can say, hey, I think this is sarcoma, or this may be lymphoma. So it's quick turnaround time. And even at the lab, if you send it off, um, it's going to be a fast turnaround time, usually one to two days. Unfortunately, it can be very vague in its report. We get a lot of lymphomas that say could be lymphoma, but could be reactive. Um, so they don't do a lot of diagnosing of certain cell types, if you will. With histopath, again, it's going to have pros and cons. It's more expensive. Um, there is some form of anesthesia required. Usually it's general anesthesia. It's going to be much more accurate in its diagnosis. So you're sending off either the whole mass or a small uh, tissue sample, if you will. And so you typically will get a more accurate diagnosis because of that. Turnaround time is going to be a little bit longer than your cytology. Sometimes it can take three or four days. Sometimes it's two weeks or more. I have biopsy samples, uh, for instance, when we send whole limbs or whole pieces of the jaw, that takes about two and a half weeks to get your sample back. And sometimes owners are not very patient. Um, so you obviously need to be very upfront with them as to how long that's going to take. It is a tool that's necessary for margin evaluation. So with our surgery, surgical oncology, excuse me, um, we want margins. We want to know how far out these tumor cells extend. And the only way you're going to know that is by a biopsy. You're not going to know that by a cytology. Ultrasound may be a tool that you guys have. I know there's quite a few of those popping up in general practice. Um, it's going to be the standard tool for pretty much all abdominal masses. Splenic tumors, liver tumors, kidney, bladder, mesenteric lymph nodes, prostatic carcinomas, all those type things um, we're going to see with an ultrasound. And we're going to be able to do our measurements with an ultrasound, which is also important. Just like you would use your calipers and your body map on the outside of the body, we're going to use ultrasound for um, things of the 
uh, things in the abdomen. Definitely want to shave. Uh, I get patients that come into our office that have been to their regular vet, you know, a week prior. They say, oh, they did an ultrasound, and it's, you know, shaggy dog. Nothing was shaved. You're not going to get accurate, um, accurate views if you're not shaving. So definitely make sure you shave. Again, something to potentially warn your client about because some people are partial to, to hair, unfortunately. With uh, technicians, it's going to be our responsibility mostly just to hold. Um, I will say, you know, we can use the ultrasound to get urine samples, things like that. But again, if you notice anything funny on the bladder, I would not recommend to, uh, to use the ultrasound because of the potential of a bladder tumor. But again, uh, most of our role is going to be restraint. And again, this is used in the collection of cells for cytology, um, both for abdominal masses as well as thoracic masses at times as well. CT scan. We have a CT scan here, and if you guys do uh, take a tour, they'll show you where the CT scan is. I used to hate it, and now I love it. It just terrified me knowing how much that machine costs and how dangerous it could be um, when I first started, but now I absolutely love them. Um, a CT scan is going to be, if you think of a loaf of bread, a loaf of bread that you buy at the store probably has 15 to 20 slices. That's what a CT is. So we're doing a, an x-ray, a long x-ray, and we're slicing the patient, if you will, to see where tumors live. Uh, most of what we're doing that with in my hospital are going to be any kind of facial masses, so nasal tumors, oral tumors, laryngeal tumors, um, things in the chest. So do we have lung lobe masses? Um, and then occasionally we will also do it with the abdomen as well, although that's less uh, frequently seen. In regards to the CT, my role is going to be anesthesia. You can't put a dog on the table and expect them to sit there for 20 minutes and not move. So these guys and girls are fully anesthetized under general anesthesia. We are setting them up in the proper position. Each CT study, if you will, has a, uh, has a weight the dog or cat needs to be sitting. Um, and then scouting, which is just the planning and positioning of all that. Unfortunately, it is expensive. I know that some universities can be less expensive than we are here and some are more. But that is going to be generally the only place that you find them. It's going to be specialty clinics and then your universities. With radiation therapy, uh, radiation therapy depends on CT scans, and so anywhere that offers radiation therapy is also going to offer a CT. Um, but we work hand in hand with a radiologist in um, Georgia at Blue Pearl. Um, I'll send them images of the CT, I'll send them the CT report, if you will, um, and like I said, they can sometimes use those to help plan for RT. And it is painless. So they're just going to sleep. Like I said, it takes about 20 minutes, give or take machine error uh, or user error. Um, so it's painless. They just go to sleep under anesthesia and then they wake right back up. I would say general cost of a baseline CT, baseline CT excuse me, is around $1,100. Um, you can look at more of like the $1,700 range if we're doing biopsies of whatever we're CTing and sending the biopsy off. Um, that's sometimes something that we'll offer as well. Um, but like I said, a baseline CT is going to be around $1,100. And like I said, I know that there's university to the west of us um, that's a good bit less than that. And then UT is usually a little bit more than us. So um, it kind of ranges in that $1,000 range. This is our CT machine. This wood slab is just used for laundry, um, so it actually comes off. Um, and then the table here at the bottom, you can kind of see how it curves. Um, it fits the patient in that. And then that circular end um, is where the beam is, x-ray beam, and that's where the patient comes in and out for scanning. Um, and I think later on in another slide or two, I'll have a, a picture of what a CT image looks like. Also in the diagnostic workup, we're talking about flow cytometry. Uh, this is going to be specific for lymphoma, B cell versus T cell lymphoma. So each delineation carries with it a different prognosis. B is better, T is terrible. Not terrible, just worse than B. Um, that's kind of how we remember it. Um, and this test is done at Colorado State University. It is the only place in the United States that does this test. If you are sending flow cytometry to um, IDEX, for instance, or Antec, they're still sending it to Colorado State. So uh, we send all of ours directly to Colorado State. If you guys are offering this test at your practice, I again would send it directly to Colorado State. You're going to save the client some, some money by not having to go through the middleman of Antec or IDEX. You're also going to get faster results. Um, usually if I send a flow cytometry on a Monday, I have results back by Wednesday. So um, like I said, you can get a quick turnaround if you send it directly to Colorado State. With this test, collection is, is pretty important. So this um, is also called phenotyping. This type of uh, test is run off of live cells. And so we are collecting blood 
anyways typically because we're doing our CBC and chemistry. We're going to take about 0.1 of that serum, add it to 0.9 of saline, and put it in a little red top with no gel. You'll take a uh, small needle, again same size you'd give a vaccine with, and get some samples of your enlarged lymph node and put that sample actually in that mixture of serum and saline. Kind of mix it up, ship it to them on ice. Um, and like I said, the, the serum is going to help keep those cells alive, so it's a live test. Now that we know what we have, um, it's time to treat. Again, you want to try to be as upfront with your client as you can. Um, what are the realistic goals? Are we looking to treat it? Are we looking to make your pet comfortable um, or somewhere in between? Primary goal is going to be to improve the quality of life, regardless of what that answer is, um, and prolong survival type, not only due to just taking the cancer away if we can, but also by making the pet more comfortable. Expectations for time. How long will he or she live? This is a big one for me. So you want to remember, every one human year, pets gain five or seven years. It's very difficult sometimes to tell a client that this diagnosis carries with it six to eight months to live even with chemo because that seems like a very short amount of time. If you translate that to human years, if I'm diagnosed with a cancer and I'm told six to eight months, again in dog terms, I'm still getting three or four years. And so you definitely need to focus on that time frame. Um, it's hard for us to be selfish with our time. It's not something that the dog or cat understands at all. Um, and so that's something, like I said, that I, that I struggle with my clients sometimes. We'll, we'll get clients in that, um, you know, they have an eight-year-old dog and they think he's old. Well, age is not a disease, and I stress that a lot to my clients. That eight-year-old dog may get two or three more years, and that, again, for us, is going to be like 20 years out. And so you have to stress the importance of time um, being different in their world than it is in ours. So we're going to treat by what approach? Um, the surgical approach uh, is obviously going to be for something that's on the outside of the body, like a skin tumor. Um, <laughs> or something even on the inside of the body, so a liver mass, um, splenic mass, things like that. What is your goal going to be or what's the client's goal going to be? Do they just want to know what it is so they can have peace of mind or do they want it completely gone so they can try to get as much time as they can? Um, with radical excisions, we're talking about amputation, which is definitely something that's needed. Radical mastectomy, we talked about the cat with the mammary tumor earlier. Maxillectomy and mandibulectomy, excuse me, so we're removing part of the, part of the mouth or even a nosectomy. I've had a few patients that look like uh, Michael, J Michael Jackson, excuse me, um, that completely had a nosectomy. It looks like something from a scary movie, but it got their pet about six or eight more months of living time that they normally would not have gotten. Mentioned seeding um, with our bladder tumors earlier. Uh, like I said, if you're getting a urinalysis on a dog that has a bladder tumor and you pull that needle out, you're seeding those cells through the abdominal wall, through the skin. You can also do this in a surgery suite. Um, so if you have um, an abdominal mass that you're taking out, once you get all that nasty out there, you've closed everything back up um, on the inside of the abdomen, switch out new gloves, a closing pack, if you will, so that you can close all the body wall with clean, fresh instruments. And you're not, again, transferring those cancer cells um, from the inside of the abdomen. Again, some things respond really well to radiation therapy. These are going to be uh, tumors or lymph nodes that are on your nose, in your eyes, on your skin, sometimes bones, sometimes soft tissue. Um, I would say the soft tissue things are going to be like um, enlarged lymph nodes in the pelvic canal if they have an anal sac mass. We've had a few of those recently. There's two types of radiation therapy. There's definitive radiation, which is more of the curative type, um, but it is more costly and definitely more cost, uh, uh, time consuming, excuse me. And then there's palliative rate, uh, radiation therapy, which is less costly, it's less treatments, but it definitely helps with um, comfort um, and time. Again, this is only offered at universities and some specialty clinics. Chemotherapy, which is what I do all day, every day. Um, it's the most common treatment option for cancer um, most in most cases. There are a lot of preconceived negative notions about chemotherapy and I hope to bust all those um, for you guys so you can then bust them for your clients because a lot of people are very scared of chemotherapy. The benefits most certainly outweigh the risks when we're talking about chemotherapy. There are very very few that have negative side effects that are severe. 5% chance uh, or 5% have the chance of hospitalization due to those side effects, a 1% fatality chance and I'll speak from experience almost four years. I've never had a cat or dog pass away from chemotherapy. Never seen it. 
how does chemotherapy work? Um, by definition, all those rapidly replicating cells, chemotherapy is going to slow it down or completely halt it. It is given a number of ways. Most commonly is going to be intravenous. We do have oral chemotherapy. We have intracavitary chemotherapy, excuse me, um, and then we have intralesional chemotherapy. What does not happen during chemotherapy? And this is kind of a big one. This is again kind of busting some of those preconceived notions hair loss our pets don't lose hair they have a totally different system of their hair growth uh, so thankfully they don't get a few doses of chemotherapy and then walk out completely bald which is nice they do not have profuse vomiting and diarrhea i know that's the thing with people um, with people they get hit real hard with chemotherapy and a lot of times they're in the hospital because of it um, very very few of our patients uh, suffer from that and they do not have a low quality of life this is bell um, she's one of the cases i'm going to highlight towards the end of this talk this was the same day she got chemotherapy she went to the park she played they have a normal normal day so with chemotherapy, um, we're gonna go through kind of the basics um, of what a chemotherapy appointment looks like. So we're of course gonna start with our exam. Has anything changed since our first visit, whether that be weight, do we have a fever, um, has a new mass popped up, has a lymph node changed in size, all the things on a physical exam. All of our patients get a CBC. We will not administer chemotherapy unless you have had a CBC within 24 hours. We don't want a neutropenic patient to come in, have a very low white blood cell count, and then give chemotherapy and just make them tank. Um, chemotherapy does stimulate the immune system, um, and typically we will see some low CB, or excuse me, low white blood cell count, um, which is what we want, but we don't want to start low. So again, all of our patients uh, across the board get a CBC if they're re receiving chemotherapy. IV catheter versus butterfly catheter. Um, the technician prior to me and some oncology technicians out there um, when I first started um, was they were using a butterfly catheter for some of our drugs. That terrifies me um, and I'll, I'll get to a picture later of what an extravasation looks like and that's why it's terrifying. A lot of these drugs are very very caustic. They have to get in the vein. It is beneficial for my stress level and for the stress level of the client um, to do an IV catheter throw in an IV catheter, you can take it right back out when it's done. It's just very, very dangerous to use a butterfly catheter, again, in my opinion. Um, once we have a catheter placed, we're going to, of course, administer the actual drug if it's intravenous. If it is an oral drug, we try to give it to them in something tasty. And then we have some form of anti-nausea medication. Either we're given a serenia injection while that catheter is in place, because we do use serenia IV, or we're sending home some serenia. Um, most of my patients and all my owners, I tell them, please have, if you're using oral serenia, give a dose before you head to the hospital. Just go ahead and have that serenia on board kind of uh, prophylactically. Our dose for our serenia is typically a mig per kg IV, usually up to two migs per kg uh, PO that we're sending home, um, and it's every 24 hours that we're using that. You can also use Pepsid or Prilosec. Um, that's kind of a, um, a good go-to over-the-counter medication, but um, for true nausea, like I said, we typically will recommend Serenia. Preparation of the drugs. Have a good relationship with your oncologist because a lot of the drugs that we use, you guys either don't need to use or you don't have the proper equipment to use. So we are going to be preparing all of our chemotherapy drugs inside of a hood, a ventilation system, um, and that's a law that's come down. Um, you should not be handling any kind of chemotherapeutic drugs if you don't have this hood. When did that law come um, It is, uh, it's been... You know, the gavels come down. <laughs> I think it actually uh, comes into true effect in January of this coming year, um, but it's, uh, it has already passed. And then PPE, so latex or chemotherapy gloves. Chemotherapy gloves are much more thicker, um, and they're actually a little bit longer. They come kind of to your mid-arm. A gown, goggles, or any kind of protective eyewear. Um, and then in some cases, we're using a respiratory mask, or uh, you should actually in all, but there are some that are a little more important. Um, one of the drugs that I use here is mustard gas in liquid form definitely don't want to breathe that in so we're using a uh, respiratory mask with that. So uh, when it's time to treat the patient um, obviously they need to be restrained and restrained well whether you're placing the catheter butterfly or regular um, you don't want them moving all around and the IV catheter and the use of butterfly catheters require one clean stick. This is not a job for a new graduate. This is a job for a very seasoned technician. It's not a six-month-old spay or neuter that you're practicing on if you will. It has to be a clean clean stick. And of course we want to use aseptic technique um, for all, all placement of catheters. Once we have our catheter placed, um, we're going to kind of set the mood, if you will. Um, we want a clear mind in a quiet environment. 
You want to reserve adequate time. You don't want to be rushed in a chemotherapy appointment um, because we, you know, we want to focus on that pet. You want to triple check your dosages. You want adequate restraint. Um, typically we're using a small IV catheter because we're having to use veins or legs very often. You want them to be comfortable and then oral drugs try to make them as, as tasty as you can. With each diagnosis there is a drug protocol but not every patient is the exact same not every patient gets the exact same drug there's nothing cookie cutter about medicine there are um, protocols like i said that work for almost all patients but there is always that one exception to the rule um, an example would be the wisconsin medicine chop protocol which is used for lymphoma this is 16 to 17 treatments given over six months the first eight treatments are given weekly so like i said we're using small gauge catheters since we're seeing them very often it's a rotation of three drugs. Um, it also includes steroid use. So that's just kind of an example of a, of a protocol. There always is a little bit of bad news. Um, the reality is there is no um, true fix for anything. There's gonna be always a chance for error, if you will, whether it be human error or medical error um, in both human and veterinary medicine. Again, try to be as upfront with your clients as you can. So if they ask you what the downfall is to XYZ, whether it be chemotherapy or otherwise, just be upfront with them. And then with chemotherapy specifically, the, the side effects that you're going to see are going to be within the first couple of treatments or the first couple of weeks of use. Doesn't mean that we just stop treatment altogether. Um, sometimes we'll change drugs, sometimes we'll lower the dose, um, or we'll add in additional supportive medication. So like I mentioned, we typically use Serenia for all of our nausea. Um, sometimes we'll add Reglan in there as well. Um, so like I said, if if we do have a negative reaction, like I said, it doesn't mean that treatment is halted. Most of what I see with my patients are going to be lethargy and decreased appetite. They just don't want to go for a mile walk. They want to go to the mailbox and come back, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and they may not want to eat their full meal. They just want to eat half of their meal, but they're not actually vomiting. That's 90% of the side effects that I see. And we do, uh, like I said, give more antiemetics if we need to. And then with some of our patients that have neutropenia, which again, like I mentioned earlier, we do expect some of that, um, we'll add in antibiotics if we need to. This is a picture of what I mentioned earlier, which was extravasation. This is why you don't ask your new graduate to place a catheter or administer chemo with a butterfly. Um, this was a dirty, quote, IV catheter. Um, unfortunately, this is seen. Knock on wood, I have had this happen one time. It was not this bad by any means, thankfully, or I probably would have walked out the door. But like I said, it can happen, and it was with the use of a butterfly catheter. What's your, what's your definition of dirty? Um, not a clean stick. Okay. So you stick and you have a little bit of a, um, a bleb there. It's kind of flowing, but kind of not flowing. It's a hard push, that sort of thing. We want it wide open. I can push as much saline through and it flows well. So um, just not 100% in the vein. After care, after chemotherapy, um, we do have periodic exam and blood work, um, and the owner is a big part of that. So we still want the owners to be mindful of what's going on with their pet with any kind of changes. And then some of our patients do go on metronomic therapy, um, which is low dose oral chemotherapy at home, either daily or a couple times a week. And with those metronomic therapies, we are still seeing them about every four to six weeks and doing blood work, making sure that we're not affecting kidney values, liver values, things like that. Unfortunately, there is always the end of a battle with our patients, obviously cancer can win, diabetes, kidney disease, what have you. I think in general with uh, euthanasia, if a client approaches you and wants to talk about it, talk about it. Don't put it off because they're reaching out to you for that um, guidance, if you will. And try to ask open-ended questions. Another thing that I really like to do is remind clients that when their pet was two or three years old, they were living a different life. So are we having more days that are like the two or three-year-old lucky, or are we not having any days that are like the two or three-year-old lucky? And that will help to guide them as to when the, um, you know, when the end is there. We do offer, we, we have services that offer hospice care, um, at home euthanasia, and again, I would say if the client's gonna be present, place an IV catheter. Um, real quick, we'll go through a few cases. These are all patients that we saw here, a few of my favorites. My absolute favorite is the first one, his name was Tubbs. Um, Tubbs was a seven-year-old male neutered labradoodle, like I mentioned, all the doodles. He went to his regular vet in November 2013 for limping and swelling of the right four. Between the two of us, regular vet and us, we did CBC chemistry, surgical biopsy, and thoracic radiographs. Uh, Tubbs was diagnosed with osteosarcoma of the radius. This is him here on the left. This is him with his owner on the right. What was our initial treatment with Tubbs? Injectable chemotherapy, radiation. We later came to amputation, and then metronomic therapy. 
As you can see, um, his owner is in a wheelchair. His owner struggled very much with us amputating his leg. Uh, he, if Tubbs could walk on all four, he wanted to make sure he did that as long as he could. Eventually, like I said, we did do an amputation and Tubbs lived for 23 months, which is, again, 15 years in human medicine. So that's something to, uh, something to equate there. He was by far my favorite and I miss him a lot. Uh, second patient is Boots Randolph. Uh, Boots was a nine-year-old malnutrited English Bulldog. He presented in January 2014 for one lymph node enlargement. Um, I believe it was his right sub uh, excuse me, right prescap. Again, diagnostics, CBC chemistry, flow cytometry because we did suspect lymphoma. We did, uh, or his regular vet actually did a biopsy. Uh, thoracic radiographs and FNA and cytology. And I will mention on the biopsy, the entire lymph node was removed, not just a piece of it, but the entire lymph node was removed. This is Boots. Uh, Boots came back with multicentric B cell type lymphoma. He had the CHOP protocol, which was injectable chemotherapy for six months. He had a rescue agent oral chemotherapy when he came out of remission called lomustine and then steroids. And Boots lived for 23 and a half months. And this was on the far right here, this was uh, one of his chemo days. He just wanted to be extra lazy that day. Uh, our last patient is Belle. Um, Belle is a 10-year-old female spade German Shepherd mix. She presented in August 2014 after the owner noticed a firm swelling around her rectum. I think even her tail was somewhat uh, deviated to one side or the other, if I remember correctly. So we did a CBC chemistry, again thoracic radiographs, three view, not two. Uh, she had an abdominal ultrasound and she had a surgical biopsy, again complete removal of the mass. Belle came back with an apocrine gland anal sac adenocarcinoma, also known as Agasaca. Uh, her treatment was surgical mass removal. We did NSAIDs. She got full course chemotherapy. She also got metronomic chemotherapy at home. Diagnosis to death was 17 months for Miss Bell. And this was one of her chemotherapy days was actually in our lobby. So again, very, very much so stress time. You hear cancer, it's all bad words. Um, but again, we can get a lot of time for our pets. Last couple slides here are just a few fun cartoons. Again, we're just trying to knock out cancer. We all know that dogs are the absolute best medicine above everything else. And this is my team. This is Ashley on the right and Dr. Vance, of course, in the middle. When we're on chemotherapy, um, most drugs, when you give the drug, you're going to see the appetite decrease within two or three days. Sometimes you'll see a late onset of that, um, of about a week to 10 days, but usually it's in the first couple. Um, and yeah, they can have appetite changes. So offering tasty stuff, making sure that they're on um, the proper antiemetics is, is definitely key. Yes, ma'am. Ear tumors, like how mm -hmm. often do you see those? Um, we see a fair amount. We also have dermatology here. So actually a lot of our ear things come in through dermatology um, when they think they have a severe infection. Once that infection gets cleared out, they'll then see an ear tumor. Um, Typical treatment for ear tumors, um, we'll do a CT on those because we want to see do they invade past the middle ear. Um, are they surgical? Are they not surgical? If they are, you can do a TICA where you remove the entire ear canal. And then some of those do follow up with radiation as well because you can get to the ear very easily with a radiation beam. So that's typical protocol of, of those. We had a case that came in and uh, unfortunately it was too late hmm. uh, for that one. But gotcha. It presented yeah, they can sometimes be hard to find because all that inflammation gets in there and kind of masks a deep, deep tumor that's down in there. So yeah. Anything else? Do you ever see a temperature spike? Um, typically we will see fevers um, if they are neutropenic. So when we give chemotherapy, like I said, we're stimulating the uh, immune system. When we drop that white blood cell count and we have nearly no white blood cells, we'll see a fever. But that's actually a good thing. That means the body's trying to fight it. When we have a very, very low white blood cell count and we have no fever, we start think thinking about sepsis and that's not going to head in the right direction typically. So most of our uh, patients, if they have a fever, they're super anxious already. Um, or like I said, it's post chemotherapy. It's not during the administration of chemotherapy. You have like a, a little bit of diarrhea. It's kind of normal. Again, it's not surprising for our patients to go through that. Um, some patients just traveling in the car get colitis. You know, we all have those patients. And so um, usually we'll treat with metronidazole to start with, a bland diet as well, and that typically takes care of it. Um, if we have kind of chronic diarrhea, then we'll use something like Tylosin powder, add that in. Um, but again, diarrhea is not um, a red flag necessarily to us in most cases. With any kind of side effects, um, we can always, you know, think about 
the dose do we need to back off um, and that's something that's important for me and Ashley to, to let Dr. Vansel know that's why we try to get a detailed history you know we want to be able to say hey last time they just tanked the owner says they didn't eat for four days and they wouldn't get out of their bed and you know if that's happened after the first treatment then he's usually going to decrease the dose to hopefully again still get drug in them because the drug is beneficial but not make them feel so bad yeah it can be cumulative as well um, but again typically even those respond well to metronidazole mm -hmm. do you ever get remission you like Yes, so remission, um, that's a good question. With remission, we talk about um, from either the day of surgery or with lymphoma. A lot of times we're talking about with lymphoma. If we see um, a patient that has peripheral lymphoma, or lymphadenopathy, excuse me, um, we start treatment. Within a week or two, those lymph nodes have gone down. That's remission. It's not the end of that 16-week treatment. As soon as those lymph nodes go down and they're not palpable anymore, that's considered remission. Anything else? How many patients do you do a day? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I usually treat 10 to 12 patients a day, four days a week. So there's a lot of cancer out there, unfortunately. Okay, that's all I got, guys. Thank you very much.